Konnichiwa. Welcome to the Jandals in Japan podcast. Daughter Catherine, boy, do we have an episode today. Wow. Look out, everybody. Here it comes. Yes. Well, I think if you've pushed play on this episode, you know who our guest is. You've seen the name in the title. Trying to stop smiling. Not happening. Very big smile today. We have just finished recording an episode with Jamie Joseph, head coach of the Japanese national team, the Brave Blossoms. How excited were we? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I mean, obviously he's a star. We know him very, very well, but he's such a human being. And we just wanted to bring his story to everybody because he talks about so many really, really important things that underlie all of what you do in Japan as a, as a person, as a business mm. person, as a tourist, as anything in Japan when you're coming here. He really underlines and highlights in yellow bright mm. yellow how to, <laughs> how to lead yourself as a, mm. an ambassador for your country as a human being in japan mm. right yeah I, I wonder if anyone's ever sort of sat there and picked his brains about this potentially not right and this is a gold mine of information that he has about how to so how much to be so. successful here so much so right? oh my goodness uh, he really underplayed the fact that he had had 20 test matches with the All Blacks playing over four years, right? He skipped over that because that's not really what he's thinking about right now. He's leading a team. He's a leader, like a leader in a, in a business would be, very focused on making sure the team gets to the next step, the next step, the next step, right? And not overdo it at the first stage with over-enthusiasm, but move through to what they want to do. They want to win this World Cup, the Rugby mm -hmm. World Cup in France. They want to win that. It's quite clear. Mm, exciting. Wow. So something that came out of speaking with Jamie today was kind of this uh, adapting to, mm. you know, what is actually happening in Japan and something that is actually happening in Japan today. If you're listening to this on Monday, the 13th of March, is that we are supposedly today able to use our personal decision-making skills to decide <laughs> whether we would like to wear a mask or not, according to the Japanese government. Indeed. They have chosen this auspicious date of March the 13th <laughs> to do this. Um, not seeing much progress, though, actually, Catherine, here in my part of Japan. How about down in Tokyo? What's the situation? Mm, it's International Women's Day this last week when we were been recording this and i went to an event and there were 55 people in the room because i did a, a little count with my mm. finger around the room count one <laughs> two three four five six and uh all of them were not wearing masks mm -hmm. it was very interesting it was sort of a european uh with the british chamber but also with spanish with the french chamber mm. and i noticed that that may have had an influence on the people who were in the room that europe moved ahead way before japan but uh, this no masks thing on the 13th, maybe it's masquerading as really still wearing masks. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer, but I do know in Tokyo when you're invited to, you can wear your mask in this meeting or not, people will take them off. I was in a uh, uh, an American Bar Association meeting the other day and that, that mm. was the offer and everyone just took their masks off. Okay. So maybe so Tokyo is moving a little bit further ahead very quickly. People are tired of them. Mm. Um, and I can see the difference there. I know in terms of um, some of the embassies, they're doing whatever the person uh, feels like. If they want to have their mask on, the people will have their, theirs on. But if they mm. don't, they will remove them all. So I think yeah. there's going to be a real variation. It's interesting mm. where you are that it's quite uh, restrained and restricted still. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I've had directives come from, you know, things I'm involved in. Uh, so you know, even though the government is saying that you can use your personal discretion, you will not be taking your mask off. You will be continuing to wear a mask until COVID is officially downgraded in May. And even then we may, there may be some situations where you're still asked to wear a mask. I'm like, I see. damn it, really? So yeah, yeah, this is, so this is where Very we're seeing, cautious. Mm. this is where we're seeing, like the government is saying it's okay, but then companies are doing whatever they want to do and you are effectively still have to do what they say. So this is kind of interesting, right? Where the government is giving like sort of saying, please use your discretion. You are able to decide, 
but then somebody else is going to decide something different for you. Right. Mm. Interesting. Right. And that could be where you're working or the, and I've, you know, I've been into a, a doctor's clinic, which had a sign up saying, we still want you to wear a mask after the 15th of you're in here. All this, I get that though. Thing, right? I, I mean, it's a clinic, clinic, right? So I yeah, feel like but even I'm before. like, are these going to be showing up in restaurants and, you know, and things as well? So I'm, yeah. mm. I get it with a clinic. And I think even before that, maybe we all should have been wearing masks and perhaps even gloves, right? Into hospitals. Why didn't we not do that before? But restaurants, I'm not sure. Mm. It's so going to be varied it's and it's not, interesting. It's going to be smooth as we thought, well, I think. Maybe it's going to take is- time on purpose to phase it in that with March, you can start doing it, but May when it's downgraded from where it is at level one of the seriousness uh, that it's brought down, then maybe things do change from May, Mm. but it could be a gradual introduction. Maybe that's part of the plan, Jane. I think it's, yeah, I think that's exactly what it is, right? So we still have a good month or two to get used to the fact that it's going to be ground downgraded in May. And we can hopefully all at some point after that move on with our lives. But very important information because people will know coming from New Zealand to Japan that this is the change, but you will still see it here and there. So be respectful where you are, uh, whoever's directed you, the company, mm. look around you, observe what others are yeah. doing and, and kind of just watch or ask, should I wear my mask or not? People mm. might say to you, it's up to you. So just... Be observant and look at who's around you and, uh, the, the, you know, just take it in that it's just Japan's taking a little bit longer than, say, New Zealand, which has tossed them away a long time ago. Mm, yeah, maybe just make sure you've still got your supply of masks. Yeah. I was thinking, do I need to buy more? You know, how many more boxes am I going to have to shell out for? It's going to be a few more before. There will be a few more. I've yeah. got a bit in stock. Mm. But anyway, as Jamie Joseph said, he's still wearing his mask. Yep. Uh, and, you know, we really just hope people can listen to this episode and really enjoy it and hear what they are doing. Uh, he talks about his experiences uh, and how, you know, the things that are top of mind for him as he focuses on preparing for the Rugby World Cup. There's quite a phrase, a turn of phrase he uses quite a lot there about boiling something and not boiling <laughs> I loved really explain I had a real visual on that Mm. and just hope everybody really enjoys this episode Jane yeah so let's hear it from Jamie hi Jamie welcome to the Jandals in Japan podcast great to have you on the show today nice to to be you guys well we like to have a warm-up question to start with (laughs) so today we're going to ask you when you arrive back in Japan What's the first thing you like to do? Um, I really miss the food when when I leave Japan. <clears throat> so I generally go to one of my favorite restaurants, which generally is which is generally sushi uh, or yakiniku. So mm. I go from the airport. I get I usually get picked up from one of my colleagues. We come into town, drop the bags off, and then we head straight off. It's For it's some just sushi. something that I've always it's done. Some... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite netta sushi netta? Well, I like everything. So, you know, like mm. I'm not really fussy when it becomes to when it comes to, to fish. I think a lot of it is because I was sort of brought up with fish at home as well. Mm-hmm. So coming coming here and then, you know, experiencing experiencing fish on another level. Yeah. And uh I just love it, you know. It's a big any, part of, any sushi, of living in Japan. Any sushi, any sushi you can't eat. I like, like it all, guys. All of it? N- no. Even no, the... I, I like it all. Even the mm. Even the the fish egg one, or the the ikura. yeah ikura, or um, yeah. uni. Yeah. Yeah. The... No, I, I love ikura. In fact, mm-hmm. I order it by itself. Ikura. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I think you're. Yeah, I've been Maori. We've been brought up with seafood all of my life. Um, yeah, catching yeah. it, yes. diving for it. It's just you know, an extension, a better extension of how I was brought a better up. Extension, awesome. <laughs> wow, Catherine, what's your favourite netta sushi netta? Sushi. I I just can't go past the magoro and in all kinds of forms right i really love the magoro that's the one i'll go to the tuna, the tuna. Yeah. yeah yeah i really <laughs> like it. it's sort of pretty Aka- obvious Akami isn't or... it akami the... yes akami the red oh, the red one really not red. the fatty one not mm-hmm. the fatty one yeah mm-hmm. oh you don't like you your otoro i'll oh, eat it oh uh, no i like chutoro you know chutoro. which is, which mm. is the, the medium flavorsome and it's sort of halfway between akami and toro there um, you go yeah, mm, mm. try try torotaku. It's a new one. It's they oh. get the toro and they 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 mince it up with a knife and then they oh. add pickles to it and then they roll it and it's 
Ooh. So my sushi nata is I don't really eat nigiri, I just eat sashimi. And then at the end, we finish with torotaku, which is a, which is toro and pickles, the yellow pickles. And then they roll that and Ooh. another one, which is kampio, which is just a vegetarian one. And then yeah, you, you sort of <laughs> save your money because it's <laughs> yeah. expensive, right? <laughs> That's the way to do sushi in Japan. Jane, yeah. what's your netta then on sushi? Oh, I'm scallops. Hotate scallops. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's my favorite. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, that's good. I'm well, we know what to order for now. Jamie if we're going to sushi. All we of do. the things. We yeah. Do. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Jamie Joseph, you are so well known in rugby circles in Japan and Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, you've had a, an amazing career with the All Blacks. Uh, you've been in Japan, I think, eight seasons now. We're super happy to have you here and we're looking forward to talking about, you know, what you're focusing on for the Rugby World Cup this year, but more so about your life as a coach in Japan, how you prepare your team, how you prepare yourself. Uh, and so we'll be putting your full bio uh, into the show notes later, but tell us about your background. I don't know anything about your background in Blenheim growing up, your early days. You mm -hmm. talked about yeah, fish and, and fishing there. And, and what led you there to come to Japan? Yeah, okay, guys. Yeah, so I'm born in Blenheim, Blenheim. My mum's family uh, are from Blenheim. So my father was originally from Tikuiti, came down down to Blenheim in his 20s and, and met my mum. And um, But my mother's family, which is the McDonald Fano, is a big family. And so as a, you know, growing up there was, was wonderful. Still have a home there and still go there take my kids back there we go there for Christmas we're fortunate to have a place in the sounds which which I've had for quite a long time it's been a family place so it's what I would regard to as my my home but obviously being a rugby coach well being a rugby player then and then now a rugby coach and traveling around all over the place life's not necessarily normal certainly not not when compared to how I was brought up uh, for my children so we've lived in Japan we've lived in uh, Wellington we've lived in Dunedin we've come back to Japan um, so my kids, are, um, well, I think they've been really fortunate in, in terms of being able to travel around the world and, and you know, and now getting a little bit older, settling down and sort of doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, we've always gone back back to Blenheim. Um, really competitive family, really sporting family, um, <laughs> wonderful memories coming and growing up. What's one of your great family memories that you can think of? There's probably so many, but something popping up for you that's just awesome memory? Well, just a little bit of perspective. So my mum was one of twenty-one. She had thirteen sisters, <gasps> seven brothers. So no you can way. you can imagine oh what, what a what a Sunday was like sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. when wow. we, all my friends were all my first cousins and you know, we went to school and there was a big tribe of us. So that's really vivid in my in my upbringing. Highly competitive uh family. So, you know, playing cards for dishes and all sorts of things. <laughs> Or, or all things like that. So there's a real competitive streak in in, mm. in the line. Um, where where now, are you and your family, like, and your siblings? Whereabouts do you come? Well, I'm the baby. I, I had three. I've got three older sisters, and then so I'm. Um, oh. Perhaps I'm an afterthought because my my father was a rugby <laughs> rugby player. So there's there's eight years between me and my younger sister, and ten ten and a half years between me and my older sister. So yeah, that's that's. Interesting. That's pretty much. That's pretty I'm much the reverse. Right. I've got three brothers. I'm the only girl. So okay. yeah. <laughs> oh, interesting. Wow. Mm. So how did you come to be in Japan? What was it that that brought you here? And it was I mean, it like I, for you, you were as a player first down in Fukuoka. Yeah. So I played. I played. Uh, I played rugby all my life, and I played. You know, and when I was young, I was, we played softball. So as I said, we're a really sporty family. Um, I made the New Zealand secondary school team when I was at high school, and that tour was to Japan, uh, funny ah, enough. So we toured. Right. First time I came to Japan, I would have been 16 or 17, 17 years of age. So that was my first experience uh, at high school. Uh, rugby took off for me when I when I went back to New Zealand, uh, which you know eventually made the All Blacks. And from the All Blacks, uh, after five or six years, rugby – went professional and at that time I decided or Mandy and I decided to to come to Japan with you know it's been a lot of time well I'd spent a lot of time you know striving challenging trying to get to the All Blacks made the All Blacks went to the World Cup in 95 and then rugby went a little bit silly in 96 and it brought me to Japan mm. 
gosh, 16, 17 in <laughs> Japan would be different to now. What do you remember about that time hitting Japan and just yeah. it'd be incredible? What do you, do you recall about those days? Yeah, in those days we we got billeted. You know, we never stayed in hotels, mm. and we, we arrived. With, I think the, the well, the first town was Fukuoka, and we mm. I was billeted by the tour family. Who, who, you know, twenty years later, when I came back as a player, you know, well, ten years later, I came back and and visited them again, and mm. keep on with social media, keep and try and keep in touch with you know my billet of those years. Um, oh wow, lovely! So lots of lots of fond memories. I, I guess sixteen. I, I remember every 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 time we went to a billet, we left for a, with a present. You know. Mm. So, so there's those small things that have a lasting impression on you around the generosity of of the Japanese people, particularly when they take you into their homes. You know, having that's big, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's you know, at home we would go around for someone's house for dinner, and certainly in my whānau there was always cousins or somebody around. But in Japanese culture, you know, it's a big deal. You know, getting mm. invited to somebody's home. Um, mm. Yes, you can. You, you'll meet at a restaurant and. You know, you'll have a formal dinner together, but going into somebody's home in Japan, it's a it's a big deal. So, uh, I guess those are the sorts of things that um, that I remember. Wow! Yeah. And fast forward from there, though, now you're the, the coach of the national team, the Brave Blossoms. Can you tell us a bit more about that role that you have? What does it entail for you each day or an average week? It must be varied, but tell us a bit more about that. I think the easiest way to try and explain it in a in short term is the the coach the coach's role at this level of rugby is you know far different to to um, to what I was used to in New Zealand. You know, coming to Japan, Sokantaku uh, they call it, and which which we would we would call that a rugby director. So the eventually I get to the game and I coach rugby. You know. Um, and that would be, if I could put it in, like in, in terms of the scale of what I do, that would be two out of ten. Because uh, you know, essentially, we play seven games over the course of the whole year, but it's everything that goes around planning, preparation, uh, selecting. That's the big part of my job. So, so you know, I've got twenty three staff. I've got uh, anything between thirty five and forty five players. So, when there was no corona, we used to carry thirty five. When COVID hit, uh, we had to carry more players because um, mm. you just never just never knew when you were going to get hit with COVID and guys were going to go down. So mm. it's a different type of responsibility, um, different type of challenge. You know, keeping you know keeping forty five athletes in, uh, engaged is difficult, um, but that's the that's the kind of thing. So what that means every day is when, like for now, example, I'm traveling around Japan trying to visit uh, all of the players and all the clubs. So yesterday, Kyoto, the day before, Kobe. Um, last night, Uriyasu, uh, the day before that, Kumagaya. So we do that for a week. We watch uh, the games in the weekend, do that for the week, and then I'll step out and one of my other coaches will will do that. And so when I'm based in New Zealand or when I'm in New Zealand, we, we'll communicate with the guys uh, via Zoom, so we bit like this. Um, the same players, so we've got four groups because um, I've got a number of coaches, and then we're on the ground. We're traveling. Yeah, I'm seeing. I'm <laughs> wondering from watching that, like, how has this New Zealander been so successful in growing the Japanese team over these years? I'm starting to see the pattern now, and with your connection with Japan from that early age of 16 years old, being in the family home with Japanese people, what what is it do you think that's helped you to to get where you are to be talking to you today? I think the rugby for me is, as a head coach has been, well, I wouldn't say the easier part. It becomes easier because you've, you've been involved with the game of rugby and, the, and, and, and rugby is quite simple if you live and breathe, breathe it like we do as coaches. Mm -hmm. The part I like about the head coaching job in Japan is, is the human side. So what I believe is the success of the team really is is from myself and, and my assistant coach with Brownie, who's also spent a lot of time living here with his family. And it's it's those types of experiences that soften, I guess, would be a word. We soften, you know, our rugby hardness and our um, – so I don't look at it as compromising. I just, I just think it's a big part of being successful in a, in a country like Japan where – you know, for me, clearly, they're just different priorities around what's important and what's not. And, you know, fighting mm. those as a rugby coach, um, you can it can unravel pretty quickly, you know. So I guess over the time, I've just 
over time in terms of playing here and, and, and being frustrated and then coaching here. I've just, just learned a, a small recipe on how to, how to do it, you know. What's in that recipe, Jamie? Can you tell us? <laughs> What's um, your, what are the priorities that you see that are just different? I mean, this is just this is just how I think. So I, I think, you know, like in, in Japan, there's so much stuff going on, you know, but but I really focus on, you know, boiling the jug, not boiling the ocean, you know, doing one thing, <laughs> you know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Be, because yeah. you can get you can get stuck, you know, because, you know, we're looking at the same picture, but somebody's seen something else. So if I try to explain the sorts of frustrations that that I'd have in a day, it would be crazy. So no, I just I just try and do one thing really well. Um, and I think if I had to give you guys what that is, it's just really understanding uh, that there's a real difference with the Japanese way of doing things and the Kiwi way of doing things. Mm. And so if I put it down to if it's a human if it's a human problem or it's a human solution that's required. If it's a rugby problem, then it's a rugby solution that's required. So mm. quite often the challenges I have are it's all it's all based around people, you know. Mm. We think that too. And what's something then that you can think of around the people difference between Japan and New Zealand that there's probably so many that pop up like fireworks in your mind, but is there something that you can think of just now that might have happened recently that you thought that's quite different to what maybe is happening back in uh, New Zealand and Japan that you've resolved in that way through a human touch? Well, I think it's just understanding. For me, it's understanding it and then not forgetting it because I guess you guys have understand what I'm what I'm trying to explain, um, but you forget, you know, because you're, you're born up in New Zealand, you're brought up a, diff a different way, and then you know it always comes back to memory when a friend might visit or or a family member might visit New Zealand, and you'll be explaining to them around, well, actually, you can't do it like that here, and and so it comes back to memory. I, I, I sort of put it down like this, like this, guys. What we what we look at as being efficient, the Japanese may look at it as being lazy, you know. So. Um, mm -hmm. We like to, we, we want to get there fast. We want to we want to do things um, in a way that's going to be more efficient. And the Japanese are more patient. You know, we just say, "Oh man, they're slow at making decisions." But I think they consider a lot more a lot more yeah. things. Before, I love before how they you make a decision. You know, so that up. yeah. So it's sort of so like when you're trying to coach a rugby team. So fifty percent of my team are Japanese. The other fifty percent um, are really diverse group. I've got Korean guys and South African guys, Aussie guys, Kiwi guys, Pacific Islander boys. So that's crazy mm. in itself, right? You know, like yeah. um, <laughs> United Nations and the <laughs> in the team kind of yeah. That's right. So but if I can't get them all, you know, on the same on the same page, then it's impossible to win big test matches. So I've done a lot of a lot of thinking about how to do that. Um I've done a lot of personal development around talking to company guys that the Japanese guys working for foreign companies is quite a it's quite a good, you know, if you think about if you're trying to do business here. Um, we've got a lot of really good stuff from the CEO of um, or the, the Japanese. He was a Japanese guy who worked for Harley Davidson in Japan. Yeah, you know, trying to explain this to foreign bosses mm -hmm. um, in terms of how to do business in, in Japan with the with the Asian market. So yeah, I try and get, I try and talk to as many people as I can with because I don't have a lot of time, a lot of time to do that. And I just I just just trial and error, I guess, just over time. Yeah. I do love how you talked about the efficiency thing, trying to do something faster, and Japan may want to take a bit of a slower approach. And it, it might be seen from a Japanese person's perspective that it's a it, you're cutting corners, right? Mm. And that the, the efficiencies of step by step and doing the method is really important, whereas we might think, no, just go to the end and do it quickly. So I love how you've called that out as really quite a big difference. You've made me think about that. Um, well, that being fast and doing things quickly is not always the best way. It might be, but mm. adjusting between those two. So you must be doing that all the time. Well, you know, like there's some things where you have to be fast. The game of rugby is fast. Yeah. You know, so I would explain to the Japanese guys, well, to the team really, you know, in rugby, we don't have time to think. You, you, mm. you can't consider. And rugby, that looks like, you know, the Japanese players at times would be guilty of waiting. Right. And... Um, you know, trying to work out what what the opposition going to do. Now it's fifteen nil, and we can't win. Um, so it's it's about a you know it's about understanding when that's working in our favour. You know, being patient, uh, being considerate, and when it's not in our favour. You know, mm. um, where where it's not necessarily uh, 
the right thing in that sport, you know. So getting that understanding on the flip side to the Japanese is crucial. And you know, and when I first got here, guys, it would take us twenty minutes to get into the game. We played our best rugby towards the end of the game, and I think that was because mm. of that. Um, mm. So, so culturally, that was working against us. You know, so that's not being lazy. That's not being considerate. That's that's high performance. That's what that's the adjustments that our Japanese players had to do. Same thing with decision making. You know, before they can make a call and make a make a decision, they're governed by perfection. You know, as a culture, so everything they do is with detail, and you know their success is measured by perfection. Well, nothing's perfect in in rugby. You know, that, that and and but explaining that in a way where they get comfortable at playing the game the way it should be is just just takes time. Mm. When you came here, you must have had a mandate or goals or things you were thinking about because you knew you were bringing the team to the uh, 2019 Rugby World Cup in Japan. What happened over the years? Has it changed from that initial stage? Are you now just focused on the next step, that boiling of the jug, as you called it? Or what what happens there? (laughs) And how have you measured yourself against what you had at the very beginning, if you can think of Jamie, a number of years ago, right, 2016? Yeah, well, certainly there was a lot of drive behind myself there was a lot of resources a lot of support um and that was just generated because it was a home world cup you know so in japan success is is the key motivator and that's what they that's what they love anything Mm -hmm. that's successful um you know anything can happen in this country if if you if you win but rugby so it's not necessarily about rugby it's just about being being successful so showcase world cup at home followed by olympics at home uh, 125 million people Japan had to um, had to be successful. So, in terms of a mandate, that was my mandate. Um, those were my personal aspirations. Uh, you know, I'd experienced living here as a rugby player prior to coming here. We had some success coaching the Highlanders, so momentum was good for for me and Tony. Um, the timing was good. The synergy was good because we both knew what it was like here, and we both knew if we could if we could do it, you know, anything can happen. And so that that was the motivator. Those were aspirations. It's a bit different now because after the World Cup, you know, when we had some unbelievable momentum, mm. COVID hit the world, you know, and yeah. and put put rugby to sleep in this country. I'm still wearing a mask, you know, um, yep. and and so it's year three or four, and, and that's got nothing to do with rugby, but that's just got everything to yeah. How the Japanese have have dealt with COVID, and then underpinning that is obviously. Myself as the national coach, trying to get a team going again. Um, mm. And that's been quite a challenge. We came to see you guys play at the, um, I wasn't going to call it the Cake Tin, that, that <laughs> uh, oh, what is it, the Stadium. Olympic Stadium yeah. um, against the All Blacks. That was an amazing game, wasn't it, yeah. Catherine? We yeah. thoroughly enjoyed that game. It's like you were out there from the beginning. There was no 20 minutes, let's get started. It was straight yeah. from the get go, and you gave. The All Blacks are shock. Yeah, it was a good yeah, we were beside ourselves. <laughs> oh. yeah, great so game. Hard, yes, it was a great game. I, I, you know, like um, rewind twenty years. I was part of the All Black team that you know put one hundred and fifty on Japan. So Japanese rugby has come a long way in in a short amount of time. Mm. Um, it was an opportunity that we let go. Uh, it was a winning it was a winning opportunity. But but I guess that just sort of you know highlights again when when you get it going when you get this you know um, when you get the team you know sort of all on the same page you know the Japanese have can well the Japanese rugby team they can they can do anything so that's what gives you know myself and Tony a lot of confidence and my other coach a lot of confidence that you know the mountain that we're climbing which is at the world cup and trying to better what we did is actually achievable because we've done that before and, and, and prior to 2019 you know i know eddie had beat south africa and and, and that was the start i, I guess of, of this major change and but yeah this covid has really put us put us behind mm-hmm. um but uh, you know that all black game i guess is a reminder what can what can happen you know if mm-hmm. you get if you get going well it's certainly interesting being one of the few All Black supporters in the stadium and cheering for the All Blacks, like just two voices, yay, <laughs> and it's, it's a silent stadium. And then Japan does something and it's like, wow, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> it was tremendous surreal. supporters, aren't they? The <laughs> Japanese supporters, the team, they, they, they get geared up. There was a lady in front of us, Jane, wasn't there, who was all in the gear. She was there and by herself. She was she, there she... by herself, but she was there to watch and support. And it was amazing just to see the mm. teams being supported yeah. by the spectators. So the question that I ask is, are they, are they supporting rugby or are they supporting Japan? And I think the answer is Japan, you know. Mm -hmm. I think I think the, the, the fan base in New Zealand and all rugby lovers, that's what we that's what we support. We love rugby, we love the All Blacks. But I think it's different here. I, th I think, you know, uh, rugby is the vehicle, but it's just Japanese supporting their country, you know, which is, which is and so when it's successful, e.g. Uh, 2019, we just saw how, uh, how awesome it was, so... Yeah. That's a little bit of a difference between us and uh, and back home. Mm. What? Noticing, oh, go ahead, Catherine. Oh, what that's that's just there's so many questions. <laughs> what's Japan? What's Japan taught you about rugby and about you as a, a leader, right? Because you are the leader of the team. I know you're talking about Brownie as well, and it sounds like you both are just connected at the hip. The way that you you work on the team. What's 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 the answer there on what's um, coming? <laughs> What's yeah, Japan. Japan taught you something. <laughs> what yeah, has Japan, Japan taught made you? you a yeah. better coach, maybe? Yeah. 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 Well, I, I think it's a hard one, but Japan has taught me about rugby. Is in Japan, rugby is not necessarily the number one thing, but what comes before rugby is is kaisha, is is daigaku, is the universities. Is so what's important, and rugby is the second thing. And mm -hmm. and if you think about the company culture compared to back home, it's about company, you know. So um lots of challenges around getting players released from companies because they've got working commitments or this mm -hmm. is to play for the national team or they've got rugby commitments at the company. So what teaches me is 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 the as a coach or as a leader here is is if I don't understand that, I'm just going to be butting heads with everybody, you know, and I'm not going to win that. And that's a wee bit which I refer to as boiling the jug, you know. So mm. It's been times where I've had to jump on a plane and fly somebody and, you know, and the Japanese face-to-face -face is powerful where, you know, we, we're basically you're asking for permission to to get a player to to support and play for Japan. We're in New Zealand. It's a professional code. Uh, rugby is the number one. Mm. I'm not sure whether I answered your question, but that's mm. the that's the sort of thing that goes on here. Yeah. And it so you know, you to be you know when Japanese. to pick. Sorry, you need to know when to pick what to do as a leader, right? Do I go to Japan and ask for this permission? Do I, do I not? Do I back back, or do I? You've got to analyze and sort of judge that in the situation. Well, I, I, I just know that companies first, you know. So that's a that's a cultural problem. Right. Can't be fixed by mm. by a rugby problem, you know. Mm -hmm. What comes right. first is kaisha, you know. So mm. if, the, if the guys have got a commitment to to the company, doesn't matter right. what I, what I say. It's this is the way it is here. So, and so the extreme is, mm. you know, we've you know we've been times where we've had a test match, um, the following week, and there's a preseason game between two company teams, and the players have to play the preseason game, which means you know <laughs> before they come in to a test Japan. match. Oh my goodness! So right. you know, year one. Can't believe it. Frustrating. Mm. Yes, even, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, debt. Yep. Yeah. Debt. Keep moving, you know. Don't get too frustrated because that affects your leadership. Right. Well, it's, well, it's good you figured that out, right? Like some people would be Still just trying like, to figure it out. Why is this, yeah, why yeah. Is this yeah. not working? Yeah. Why Keep is trying it? pushing, right? There's mm. no point. Yeah. And, yeah. and work, work with. I've got some really good Japanese colleagues that support me, uh, who know who know me, you know, know know my way and um, what's important for me, and are really and they those guys are crucial. So, I coach with Japanese coaches who I played with, who I played Japan with, um, who understand you know, my key drivers. So, there's some parts of working and living in Japan that will never change, and good on them, you know. Um, but I've got to be able to, because when I'm running and, and when I'm working and I'm really busy, you, you do get clouded, you do get busy and your head, you know, your head don't, you know, goes in the sand a bit. So you've got to have people that you trust around you. And so that's a, that's probably a, a really key thing for me. So I talk about Brownie, but in behind Brownie and myself, there's, there's some really important people. Mm. That's interesting that you, you've know you notice that the Kaisha is number one, right? So you're not trying to change that system. You're, you have to work with the system of Kaisha is number one 
and I'm trying to get the best team for Japan together, but Kaisha is number one. So yeah. how am I going to do that? So you, that's the, you're boiling the jug, right? Rather than boiling the ocean, which is trying that's to, right. yeah. yeah. Like yeah. why is Kaisha number one? Why isn't the national team number one as it would be in my own country? Correct. Right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. yeah. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's that's probably the so if you start there, then everything starts to make a little bit more sense. If you finish there, you know you're at your ends, but and you're ready to throw the towel in and head off home, you know. And so, yeah, I'm still I'm still here. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do people call you Kantoku Kantoku San? What do they call you over there? Like oh yours? Jamie San, yeah Jamie so San, Jamie yeah, San. Yeah. Okay. You're not Kantoku San. Uh, I I think. <laughs> You know, or something. Oh, I'm not on my not on my team. No, no, oh, okay. Um, have you got a I nickname just, though? Do they just call you Jamie Sun, or have you got uh, another? Like you call Brown. Yeah. Everyone in rugby calls someone a nickname, right? Brownie. It's never Brown, right? It's Brownie. Yeah. So what's yours? Well, not the Japanese don't. No, they wouldn't. No, you no, no. no, but all the foreigners do. Yeah. <laughs> um, but 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 that's sort of a, a foreign thing, and 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 yeah. that's that's not a Japanese not a Japanese thing. Um, so Jamie Sun. Well, mm-hmm. sarcasm, um, you know, taking the piss. The, the Japanese just don't do that, you know. We, we, that's a big part of the banter in, in, in sporting circles, certainly back at home. So you've always got to be on guard in New Zealand. Uh, and here, you know, you <laughs> oh, look after you. For the, for the, for the <laughs> jabs, right? Do people know yeah. you? Like when you're out and about in the streets, does anyone know you? I mean, are they rugby fans who might notice you? Or are you actually able to be quite incognito around town? I uh, used to be. Um, yeah. It's, oh. Uh, <laughs> so the, the mask works sometime. No, it's honestly yeah, uh, since yeah, 2019, yeah. Uh, the popularity of the sport. And, and and I'm just sort of giving you my view around that. It's, it's, it has gone another level. But again, you know, highly respectful culture. It's not too bad. It's quite nice, you know. And then when you want to get away from it, you just got to, you know, just make sure you don't go to the the wrong places. Um, Stay away from the rugby areas. Yeah, Yeah. right. Mm. Plenty of nooks and crannies in in Tokyo, as you know. So, (laughs) well, come up to Fukushima because I did a little survey yesterday, and nobody knew who you were. So you'll be fine if you come up here. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. There's plenty of room for rugby to grow in Japan. Is what what I sort of noticed. Like, there's lots of chances for rugby to go onwards and upwards and recently my daughter's school um she's in the fifth grade she's 11 she came home she said i scored a try at school today mum and i'm like wow why she said oh we're we're playing tag rugby in pe so this is probably happening across many primary schools in japan kids are learning rugby now in, in a way that's that to me that's amazing um progress for rugby in japan yeah, yeah. Again, uh, yeah. A lot of that stems, you know, even when I was a uh, a kid, and you know, with the World Cup soccer would happen, everyone would have a soccer ball for the next year or two, you know. And then, so it's it's great how that happens. It's hard to win, and but it's it's important to play a brand, a brand of rugby that really attracts, you know, a followership, and that's a big part of um, that's a big part of what I think is, you know, it's going to be hard to to beat some of the biggest teams in the world, which we're expected to win. But we've got to we've got to make sure that with the brand of rugby that we're playing is uniting people. So that's that's all part of it as well. And in that lead up, I mean, you you got the um, All Black Fifteen, you've got Italy. That's all just the boiling the jug. It's one game by one. Is that how you're approaching it, or do you have a longer term view too? Well, on the tenth of September we play Chile, and that's the first World Cup game for us. And right. So if you start there, you know, if you start with with the end in mind, you go well. What's the purpose of New Zealand 15 in the first weekend of July? It's just part of mm-hmm. your preparation. The hard thing for us as coaches is we're in a culture where uh, they love success and um, is to be able to, you know, build a team in a way where your rugby is improving and developing and being success along the way is second is the second prize um, and peaking at the right time. So mm-hmm. if if we're playing our best rugby in, in July, and this is – um, this is what I think is if we're playing our best rugby in July, it's going to be hard to maintain in September, mm. October when the World Cup, Cup gets played. So just the balance again, you know, getting it getting it right. I think that's that's a big part of my job. Pacing yourself and keeping mm. your stamina and keeping it to really get to the end goal, right? Yeah, I love that. That's really important. 
there's a lot of Kiwis playing in Japan, right? Playing rugby, coming over here. Is there something about the way that New Zealand plays its rugby and these 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 Kiwis who are coming in here as rugby players, but also in general, that helps people succeed in sport here in Japan in the game of rugby? Also, you know, a little bit further beyond that, maybe in the way that they do business in Japan. What are your thoughts on that, Jamie? There's a few things going on there. So from my personal experience, I played for the All Blacks for four years and just felt it was time. It's a high-pressure environment. Went to a World Cup. You, have, you look ahead and go, well, am I going to make the next World Cup? Am I secure in this position? I, I felt I was secure for another year. And then so you make a decision around future future over jersey. Um, so fast forward 20 years now and the game's fully professional and, and the players that play rugby now have only known professional where I, I was an amateur for half of my career. And, mm, right. and so my um, motivators were different. I just wanted to be an all black, you know, just that's all I, I don't care about money. I just wanted to be an all black and then money happened. And so it changes where these guys are brought up in the world of professionalism. So, you know, right from, you know, the high school rugby until, if I can use Bowdoin Barrett, who's now in his you know, early 30s, he's played nearly 100 test matches. The motivators are, you know, obviously mm. different. Uh, it's a career. Um, coming to Japan for experienced professionals, so the level of rugby is not as physical and not as demanding on the body as uh, some of the competitions and test matches that they would be normally used to. So they have longevity and they mm. can actually extend their careers. Um, financially, it's really good for the guys. Um, and, and something that you don't hear is um, that I experienced as a play with kids was spend a little more time at home, you know, because you, you then you do because you're not traveling around. You you live in I lived in Fukuoka, you're training and and stuff, but you, the external demands on on you as a rugby player are minimal compared to home. So that's a nice thing, you know, if you've got a young family, and I think that's appealing to some of the guys. Hmm. Interesting. Do you think there's some yeah. X factor that Kiwis bring? Is it are they any different to the chaps coming out of South Africa or from uh, Australia? Do you think? Do you think there's anything different uh, there? Well, I, I I thought there was. You know, <laughs> there, <laughs> I, I thought there was, but 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 I think, and the reason I say I thought there was is because when I was playing here, there really was only Kiwis here. You know, there might have been a sprinkling of Australian guys, um, a sprinkling of Pacific Islander boys, but really it was just the Kiwis up here. Um, now, now it's it's you know what professionalism uh, professionalism has done is it's a different way of looking at everything. It's it's a market. Um, you know, agents and companies have got access to players all over the world. You know, mm -hmm. um, it just comes down a lot of the time to the dollar, and that was part of my decision making as a rugby player. The other part was was where I was where I wanted to live. You know, what sort of company um, I wanted to get involved with from a rugby perspective. So the, the one that I chose. With Grand Bishop was a was a starting off. They were just starting up, you know. So mm. that was a different challenge again. Got into coaching, so it's a wee bit of horses for courses for different guys. What's one thing that's really surprised you about being a coach here? Because you've been with Highlanders, you're now obviously with Brave Blossoms. What's been one big surprise that you thought oh. at the beginning you'd never really thought would have happened, but then you find it happens. There could be so a few things there that we don't know. So I played here for eight years and then I came back and forward as a, what they refer to as a spot coach. So living and working in New Zealand, but, you know, um, coming back over here and doing a month here and doing a month there, helping out uh, certain teams. So it keeps you um, up to date with what's going on here. When, when I came back up here, um, the, fo the focus was really, and I sort of talked about this before, really was just about, you know, winning at the World Cup and at the Home World Cup. And even though I knew if the team was successful, you know, different opportunities are going to happen, I was blown away, you know, at, at the World Cup. Um, because when you're a rugby player or a rugby coach, when you, it's like running on a treadmill. Once you get on there, it's you, you, you're just running all the time and it just comes down to the next game. So it's in reflection. I just love the gratitude and the respect that was shown to the team you know, at the at the end of the cup. Um mm. yeah, it was it was a tearful moment, right? I I just so proud of the team in Japan and the way that they played and the way that the crowds and all countries just gave such gratitude and admiration to Japan and to the people. It was just 
being yeah. here and experiencing that it's just yeah. absolutely brilliant yeah yeah same oh, <laughs> it's a good time <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's move forward. What else are you seeing perhaps in Japan, things that are around you, not necessarily related to rugby, but also to rugby, that are really good gold mines or perhaps opportunities for Kiwi businesses or Kiwi people coming in here, maybe leveraging the way that we are uh, mm -hmm. Kiwi? Um, anything there that you can think of, Jamie, that you might see as a inspiration for people listening? Well, well I think um, being genuine, so forget about the language, you know, I think through experience is the Japanese uh, the best at observing people and so they're highly observant and they are watching and you'll be somebody else in behind that you won't even see and they'll be watching. Everyone mm. is everyone is Everyone's always observing the, the, yeah. the little things. So for mm. for anybody that wants to create a relationship in, in Japan. Being, being genuine is is crucial, and Kiwis are genuine people. Um, but don't don't be mistaken around language because you know body language and being genuine is international. You don't need mm. to understand how somebody speaks or how to read kanji for that. And understanding that the priorities are different, you know. So what's important to you may not be important to them. And we sort of talked about it earlier on, where it takes a bit of time, but the reason it takes a lot of time is they're considering different things, you know, before they're going to go into business with somebody. And then there's the middle part, which is um, it could take forever to talk about. But the last part is, the last part is, is once you achieve that, uh, you're here forever. It's hard to get out of here, you know. Um, and so that's <laughs> yeah. You yeah. guys and, and myself are sort of testament <laughs> of that. It's it's a hard country to leave because they keep on throwing things at you, you know. Yeah, once you get over that hurdle and you build that trust, yeah. the sky's the limit, honestly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that really is great. Yeah. Is there anything you wanted to ask us, Jamie? We always let let our guests I feel, give I us feel a... Like I, I feel like I should have been prepared to ask you, but yeah, as I said to you earlier on, I've <laughs> just come up for breath. For a breath. Oh, yeah, I know. Um, yeah. I think it's great where you give a perspective around Kiwis living over here and... and because it's not always it's not always easy, you know. Like it's actually quite hard. But my my lasting thing would be to you know when you come over here, you're sort of trying to identify whether it's a. I'm using the word human, but it really, if it's cultural, then you've got to think culturally and and from a human perspective rather than your business or what you have or or, or what you can do and what solutions you have. Mm. And I think if you can, you know, if you can think along those lines, then um, well, my experience should it becomes a little bit easier. You yep. said it. Yeah, that's it. Brilliant. <laughs> All right. Jane, do you want to do anything else? Anything else? <laughs> questions we can we ask want, We have lots of secret questions we receive from people around town. Oh, but really? I think, yeah, I think we'll call it a day. <laughs> Before we finish up, have you heard of a, a really nice little podcast called the Japan Rugby Weekly Podcast? No. You should have a listen to it. It's a oh. great podcast. And they they talk about mm. all of what's going on with all the games in Japan in English. And mm. it's hosted by the Dinobores translator, Doug Pickin. Oh, yeah. Doug oh, yeah. Pickin. And, and his, his, his sidekick is um, Hayden uh, Bedwell Curtis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hayden Bedwell Curtis. Oh, yeah. And I think Ben, who is currently back in New Zealand yes. with a little bit of an injury getting over that, he's also on the, the threesome that run that. And it is super fun and very interesting. They give predictions for the games coming up and then they do a debrief uh, around the grounds, they call it, coming on the, the week later. And they are hilarious well, good. as well as being uh, really, really switched on to what's going on in all the teams. It's really fun. Mm. Yeah, it's a great resource for people who are wanting to get in to know more about what's happening in rugby in Japan. Because I feel it's kind of difficult to know, right? It's all mostly in Japanese if you can find anything yeah. about it. So, yeah, if you're a new new fan of Japan rugby, I think we're going to see more New Zealand fans given some of the players who are coming to play here in yeah. the near yeah. future. Yeah. I I think that's only uh, going to improve. I mean, I you know, and that's a problem for New Zealand rugby, but it's the players are coming over here earlier, younger. There are more players. The rules now allow players to play, you know, teams to play more foreign players. It is going to drain some of our players. And the one that worries me for New Zealand is the younger guys. Are, guys are coming here younger now, which which basically means 
they're not willing to, they're not patient around trying to become an all black, you know, and that's a bit of a concern, but that's what we've got to deal with back home. And there's more and more players, you know, some of these teams have 10, 15 foreign players playing for them, you know? Yeah. Wow. Good information. Mm. Um, I don't know if you know Jess Souchon. Do you know Jess? She's a sports an- no, she's analyst. A analyst. She's the analyst for, for oh, the right. Dynabores. And then she oh, probably yeah. knows Shimpe, your chap, oh, yeah. quite yeah, yeah. well. Mm. But mm. she was on the show, the Japan Rugby Weekly podcast, and she talked about being an analyst. She finds it very hard when she's watching a game of rugby to get out of analyst mode. And she's always right. watching the game as an analyst. Do you have that when you're a, a coach? Do you find it hard to actually watch a game of footy out of just to enjoy mode. it, yeah. Just enjoy um, it. Yeah, no, I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it is hard not to because we're always sort of looking for trends and yeah. and different things. But we look at the game differently, you know, as coaches. Mm-hmm. So in, in our setup, there's a half a dozen coaches, and we all look at different things, obviously, mm-hmm. because we've got different roles within coaching the team. Yeah. But it is it is difficult. It is difficult to do that because when we watch so much rugby, um, when we're looking at League One rugby, we're not necessarily watching teams play. You know, we're just watching individuals and thinking, you know, could could that guy play for us in the way we want to play the game? So we're not watching how uh, Mitsubishi Dynabors play the game of rugby, and we're not watching how Kobe play the rugby uh, play the game. We're just looking at their players. Mm. Um, but when we're looking at international teams, you know, who who lead the charge around trends, you know, particularly the top teams, yeah, we are really analytical around what they're doing and what they're trying to do. All righty. Well, I think all that's right. all from me. Have you got anything <laughs> else there, Catherine? I think we'll hold it there. And so yeah. we just wanted to say again, Jamie, congratulations on being a really successful jandal in Japan. Yeah. Thanks for telling us your, your tips and tricks and insights into the human side of being a coach in Japan. And thank you very much for telling us all you did today. We really appreciate it. No worries. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> we wow. Lucky us. Lucky us who have had that time with Jamie Joseph. Wow. Fangirl moments, Jane. Yeah, we, we had a bit of a fangirl. We, we were well behaved, though. We didn't get too squealy or <laughs> like, no, fangirls on many levels right the rugby mm. part because he's from new zealand he's from the south island there's that kind of level there's yay. the kiwi thing right yay. yeah but there's also the fact that i love rugby he he's lives and breathes it as he says there's that level but there's also just this this person level and the respect mm. for japan and as he was talking i had to stop myself from getting emotional because it's absolutely why we are here and staying in japan is that human level and the way that Japan has treated us with such respect. Yes. That yes. why on earth should we not be doing it back? And he brought that out in so many ways with not expecting to put your little New Zealand template across Japan and do it our New Zealand way, but really mm. and truly uh, being genuine mm-hmm. in the way mm. that we work and live and play in Japan. Yeah, isn't it interesting how that, that thing popped up with like the Kaisha is number one, the company's number one. And you would think, why on earth is the national team not number one? What what is this system that doesn't value the national team as number one? But he didn't try and change that, right? He's like, okay, that's a system. How can we work with the system but still try and get the best players? Yeah. Maybe it takes me flying down to meet some Shacho and asking for permission personally, <laughs> whatever it takes. Would have been yeah, majorly different amazing. to what he was used to mm. doing, right? To think, how do I, I have to go and ask some CEO, may I have your player? Mm. That's a completely different mindset and way of playing the game of getting mm. people on the team mm. than it would have been back in Kiwiland. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. So really fascinating. Interesting. Yeah. God, you could have been butting your head against the wall trying to get that system sorted out, but. I don't think it's going to change any time in the near future, sure, right? Sure. <laughs> no. I think, as Jamie said, you know, people are always observing and watching us, and I, mm. I feel that very literally. But also, has that not helped him in the fact that he did observe, he was being observed and watched the way he went around the shuttles and around the, mm. the companies and did this, and that's helped him along his way mm-hmm. to be successful here. Mm. He's adapted mm. uh, to the way of doing things here. But yep. brought his New Zealandness and his rugby experience, but he's been very respectful to Japan. Mm. Yeah, yeah. There's there's something to it that the way he's been so successful here, 
the way he has worked with what is here and yeah made the most of what he can do with his his skills it's fantastic lucky japan to have him lucky leading japan. leading the team to the next rugby world cup i'm super excited to support oh, japan in their next rugby world cup as well very much so it'll be very hard actually to should right. I say that? <laughs> Choose between two teams uh, that are dear, dear, dear to our hearts. It's lucky I've got a rugby jersey that's half uh, red and white and half black and white. Oh, excellent. So I can't wait to be wearing that this year because I will probably be on both sides. Yes, yes. Well, we will support both. But, yeah, I didn't think there would be a day I would support the Japanese rugby team. But there we go. Here we are. Love it. Thank you, Jamie, so much Thank for being you so much, Amy. Uh, a super, super person on the on the show with us today. You know, I take away from what you said, creating relationships, uh, being generous to Japan because she's generous to you mm. and, and looking after the people. Thank you mm. very much. Thanks for listening. Make sure you check out our guests' links in the show notes. This podcast is brought to you today by Catherine O'Connell Law and Pod Launch with Jane. If you have a great story you think should be on the show, come and find us on LinkedIn or Instagram. We'd love to hear from you. See you next time. Mata ne!